Hi, my name is Ken Daniel, and I'm from the Lake County Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. We're a group of hams that get together and concentrate on making sure that we can provide emergency communication services uh, to special events and also if there's an emergency outage. But we do a lot of other things too. And what we're trying to do is a outreach to help people, help yourselves, get your radio merit badge. So there's a lot of information to be learned for the radio merit badge. And to make it easier, we've broken it down into different sections. And associated with each section is a quiz. You have all the quiz questions in front of you. You should have a handout with them. So as you go through it, as we go through the section, you'll be able to fill out and answer the questions. And then at the end of each section, well, you can pause and make sure that everybody in the troop has got the right answer. So we're not going to be grading this each question um, on the quizzes. What we want to know is that you, you've understood the inf information and you'll be able to answer some of the questions we have about the material. So do your best in filling out these questions. Um, like I said, they're open, open notes, open buddy, open scoutmaster. You can go back and review information. Spelling doesn't count. Grammar doesn't count. It's getting the ideas down and getting it into your head. So let's go. So this is the radio admirer badge, and you're probably familiar with radio. It's all around us. Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cell phones, uh, drones, airplanes, they all use radio. And what is radio? Well, radio is the transfer of information using electromagnetic waves. Nah, too much. It's the transfer of information using some sort of waves. We'll get into what kind later on. So there's two basic kinds of radio. One is broadcast radio, where the station sends out music or talk shows or other kinds of information, uh, and you listen to it. Nothing comes back via radio. The other, the other way is two-way radio communication. That's where two people are talking together, trying to accomplish something, like a policeman talking back to the base station or trying to get, get help. The previous examples were commercial. They were in business or using com communications along with their business. But in addition, there's hobby radio. And there's no license required for this. And there's one-way communications you know, for re remote control things. I, you probably have at least one of these in your home. And there's also two-way uh, hobby radio. This is FRS, the little yellow transmitter. It's done uh, very short range communications. Typically you buy a couple of walkie talkies and talk to each other. And then there's citizens band. Uh, the gentleman down in the corner is using citizens band. And this is used primarily by truckers or people that are traveling a lot because it's very easy to talk to people uh, locally traveling down the same road. There's another kind of hobby radio called ham radio. And this uses transmitters which, which have much higher power and require a specialized license. And we do various things with that. We communicate via voice or computer to computer, uh, which is digital communications. And we can transmit over thousands of miles. The red squares and the yellow squares on this map indicate the places that I've communicated to within the last two years. Now, besides just communicating from our homes, we do other things. The gentleman up in the upper right-hand corner is communicating with a satellite. He'll be talking to probably the International Space Station where it has a receiver and will also transmit what he's sending back down to another ham at a distant location. The gentleman down in the lower right-hand corner is on a fox hunt. He's trying to find a, uh, a hidden transmitter someplace within the T local 20 miles, uh, and he's probably in competition with other people trying to see how quickly he can find it. In the upper right-hand corner is something that I'm very interested in. We get large balloons, fill them with helium, and add a small transmitter, and then we track and see where the balloon can go. 
I've had one go all the way to Romania via Iceland and, and Portugal. Some hams like to build equipment. They get components and they connect them up, uh, either their own design or designs that they find in, on the internet. And it helps them to, to, to do something that they can't buy off the shelf or to do something better, that, uh, better than the, the available equipment. Like I said earlier, I belong to a club that specializes in emergency communications. We go through training and have uh, drills to make sure that our equipment are capable of communicating despite any kind of problem. You know, we can communicate without power, without cell phone, without internet. We can provide backup emergency communications whenever needed. Uh, in some cases, it's been very important. Uh, it was one of the primary communications left after Hurricane Katrina. But more often we help out with different events like bicycle races or canoe races. Some hams like to bounce their signals off the moon. This is called Earth Moon Earth uh, ex exercises. This is an emergency. This is just for fun. Then last, uh, some of our hams are, are part of Skywarn and they watch weather conditions around them and report them in and that goes up to a centralized location. You know, things like the size of hailstorm stones and down trees um, block traffic. So here are a few more things that we do with our radio. We can do long distance slow scan television, sometimes from the International Space Station. We uh, climb mountains and set up transmitters on the top of mountains, uh, so summits on the air, and then Sometimes we do mobile. Uh, a lot of times we do mobile in cars, and occasionally we do mobile on bicycles. And then we go to different parks, even par local parks, uh, and set up our transmitters and have fun showing people what we can do with our radios. There's also Jamboree on the air. This is where we support the scouts, and we open up our ham radios and let the scouts use their ham radios to contact other ham radio operators, uh, excuse me, other scouts on the, around the world. One of the topics on the exam is call signs and the understanding of what call signs are. A call sign to a radio or TV station is its license plate. So a license plate to a car is the same as a call sign to a station. Uh, you might be familiar with some of these. Uh, WGN, WBBM, or WLS are, are common radio stations in the Chicago area. Uh, all TV stations and also all ham radio stations have a call sign. The one, the yellow call sign there, is a ham radio call sign. It's required that these call signs be transmitted every, every so often. For ham radio, it should be transmitted every 10 minutes in order to identify the, the station that's doing the transmission. There's so many letters and call signs and trying to transmit them, it's easy to mistake one letter for another. There's a lot of letters that sound very similar, like P and T and B. You know, when you're transmitting and there's lots of static and there's another station close to you that's kind of giving you interference, it's pretty easy to get things mixed up. So even when you're saying words like Phil and Bill, you know, it's very easy to get that mixed up. So what has been developed in communications over the last you know, 75, 80 years is a phonetic alphabet. So if you need to spell something out using your radio and the conditions are, are a little bit difficult, you use the, the phonetic alphabet instead of spelling. So Kilo instead of K, Romeo instead of R. My call sign is K9 Yankee Oscar, or Kilo 9 Yankee Oscar for K9YO. Call signs in the United States are assigned by the Federal Communications Commission. This is the organization which is responsible for the regulation of the use of radio waves throughout the United States. Now, radio waves go across country borders, so there has to be another organization that is a worldwide organization. So this makes sure that 
a particular radio channel in, say, Canada isn't used for aviation and the same channel in the United States is used for television. You know, you can't have that kind of conflict. So this International Communications Com Union uh, coordinates that across countries. It also assigns prefixes. Uh, prefixes are the first few letters of a call sign. For example, if I hear a radio station calling out I am PP8GQ, I could look up PP8 and see that it's from Brazil. Uh, the United States have certain letters assigned to it so that any radio station within the United States has to start with one of those letters in addition to K. So we're ready for our first quiz. Here are the questions. Describe activities that the amateur radio operators can do on the air once they have earned their amateur radio license. Explain what radio is, and then discuss the following. You can read this on your handout. And then we have uh, one more question. Next question. Discuss what the Federal Communication Commission does and how is it different from the International Telecommunication Union. Write it down quick. Okay. Okay, we're going to be talking about the secrets of radio waves. Okay, let's talk about how this works. You talk into a microphone. The microphone converts your voice into electrical pulses. The electrical pulses at the frequency of your voice go into a transmitter, and the transmitter combines your voice frequencies with the radio frequencies and sends a small voltage up the antenna. That small voltage going up the antenna creates a radio wave that goes out from the antenna to a receiving antenna. When it hits the receiving antenna, it causes very small voltage changes. Those very small voltage changes go back into the receiver and are amplified and the radio frequencies are taken out and the audio or the voice frequencies are then sent out through a speaker to your ear. Now these two things can be thousands of miles apart. One could be in the United States, the other could be in Europe. But that's basically how it works. So let's get into a little more details of how these radio waves actually work. Okay. And going from the transmitter to the receiver, it can propagate or, or travel uh, in various paths. There's a ground wave path. Oh, excuse me. Let's start out here. There's a straight line of sight path down here at the bottom where the transmitting antenna can actually see the receiving antenna. Then there's a ground wave propagation, which is just a little bit different than the sight of light, line of sight propagation, where the radio waves will curve around the Earth, but it only curves very slightly. This, this diagram is highly exaggerated. You can only transmit approximately 50 miles or less, typically less, using ground wave or line of sight propagation. On the other hand, skywave propagations can go all the way around the world. And the way it works is the transmitted radio wave goes up and is reflected off the bottom of the ionosphere and it comes back down and is reflected off the Earth and then bounces back to the ionosphere, bounces off the Earth, and keeps bouncing around until it's hit, it hits the receiving antenna. That's called DX, or distance uh, transmissions. Okay, quiz number two. Sketch a diagram showing how radio waves travel locally and around the world. Explain the difference between distance and a local station. Quick. So what is a radio wave? Well, if you're standing in Lake Michigan and you see waves coming at you, the water is going to be going up and down on your leg. So let's say it's going to go up and then it's going to go down and up and then it's going to go down on your leg. Well, a radio wave is, is similar to that. It's actually an electrical field 
that gets stronger and stronger and then weaker and weaker and then goes in the other direction and then the electric field reverses gets weaker then goes in the other direction so it's an electric field that that follows a wave pattern so it's not only electric field but there's also a magnetic field as this gets smaller a magnetic field gets larger and when this gets when the electric field is at its peak the magnetic field is at its minimum so that's why they call it an electromagnetic wave it's an electric wave and a magnetic wave back and forth back and forth back and forth electromagnet 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 and that's what makes a radio wave now radio waves have properties and one of the biggest property one of the most popular properties is the wavelength so if you're sitting and standing in Lake Michigan you can see the wavelength it's the, the distance between the peaks of each of the waves same thing in radio it's the distance between the peaks of the waves it's called wavelength the height of the wave is called the amplitude now there's another property of waves and that's called frequency so if you're standing in Lake Michigan and the water's going up and down your leg the speed at which it goes up and down your leg is called the frequency so how many times per second does the water go up and down your leg now you can kind of think that you can see the distance between the waves and you know the frequency of the water going up and down it's probably got something to do with the speed of the, how the fast the wave is coming towards you and that's correct wavelength and frequency are related there's long wavelengths and short wavelengths and if you have a long wavelength you'll have lower frequency so if you're standing in Lake Michigan and you see the waves that are that are far apart coming at you they'll be going the water on your leg will be going up and down slower if you if the waves are close together then the frequency will be higher the water on your leg will be going up and down more quickly so wavelength and frequency are related the shorter the wavelength the higher the frequency the longer the wavelength the lower the frequency now radio waves are only one type of electromagnetic wave there's other waves at higher frequencies visible light is the same as radio waves but the frequency is much much higher even x-rays and gamma rays are the same as radio waves but they are very very fast frequencies okay so the frequency there can be radio waves of different frequencies and we talk about the all the range of these frequencies as the spectrum of frequencies and we're going to be dividing this spectrum of frequencies into various parts the first is medium wave then there's high frequency very high frequency and ultra high frequency so it's medium frequency high frequency very high frequency ultra high frequency now there's also super high frequency where there's microwaves but we're not going to be talking about that so let's just consider these because these are the most popular bands for all the radio that you see around you so, all right now let's take each of these bands one at a time and see what kind of radios are, are in these bands the medium wave uh, medium frequencies go from about 300 kilohertz 300,000 kilohertz to 3 megahertz we talked about frequency as cycles per second a cycle per second is the same as a hertz so 300 kilohertz is 300,000 cycles per second does anybody know how fast uh, voice uh, frequencies are voice frequencies typically only go up to about 3 kilohertz so we're talking about frequencies much higher voice uh, is a, a pressure wave in air radio waves are an electromagnetic wave but their frequencies differ a lot so in the medium wave medium frequencies we have the standard am broadcast frequencies you can listen to these in your car radio we also have marine radio and we also have the 160 meter uh, ham band remember we said that frequency and uh, wavelength are related so in ham radio we sometimes interchange frequency and 
and uh, wavelength. So in this case, we would talk about the 160 meter band, which is at about 1.8 megahertz. The next band is the high frequency band. It goes from 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz. And this band contains a lot of ham radio bands. And again, typically we refer to these bands by their wavelength and not by their frequency. So there's an 80 meter band, a 60 meter band, a 40 meter band, a 30 meter band, a 20 meter band, and, and, and several others. Now these bands are the bands that typically can communicate around the world. And some of them can communicate much better than others around the world. In this band, in the, in the high frequency band, there's also the citizen, citizen's band up here near 30 megahertz. The next band that we'll be talking about is a very high frequency band. The very, it goes from 30 megahertz up to 300 megahertz. And this band contains the TV, uh, some of the TV. Uh, the lower channels are contained in the VHF area. It also contains the FM band. So the car radio FM comes right in here, and we'll be talking about a signal at 100 megahertz later on. Also on this band, we have aviation. We also have police and other, other, other um, radio services. And again, we have uh, weather broadcasts. We have several ham bands that are very popular. These are most popular for local communications using handhelds or, or mobile uh, radios in your car. The UHF band goes from 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. And it contains the higher channels of uh, television. It contains several cell phone bands. It contains several ham radio bands. And these are uh, not very popular, uh, not used much. Uh, there's FRS, GMRS, which is the um, hobby radio short range uh, walkie talkie communication. We have Wi Fi and we have Bluetooth. So let's have a review. We have medium frequency with the AM broadcast, submarine, and a ham band, the HF band, which is has lots of ham radio bands, which are good for long range communication. We have the very high frequency band that contains the television, FM radio, aviation, and some ham bands for, for short range communication. Then we have UHF, which contains the higher, higher um, channels for radio, and also cell phones, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. Okay, so now we're ready for quiz number three. Okay, the next thing that we're going to be talking about is what affects the propagation of these sky waves. What affects the bouncing of the signal off the ionosphere? So there's three things that affect the reflectivity of the ionosphere. The number one thing is the solar activity. Solar activity follows an 11 year cycle, as you see here in this graph. Once the solar activity is at its peak, the ionosphere is highly charged and reflects a lot of energy. When it's at its minimum, there's very little energy in the, uh, uh, in the ionosphere and reflectivity is very poor. In addition, the time of day makes di difference too. Uh, when we're in a poor cycle, uh, the reflectivity is maybe good for a few hours during the day. Uh, but at night in the evening, uh, as soon as the sun goes down, the reflectivity goes down and back to zero, and you can barely get uh, communications uh, just locally. Uh, but when there's very strong solar activity, the ionosphere will stay charged over the entire night so that all of the bands can be used uh, almost continuously to do long range communications. So the time of day affects the amount of transmission, the amount of, of DX activity. Now also the frequency too, depending on how much solar activity there is, 
some of these bands can be active. So like we're at the solar minimum now, uh, basically uh, anything above 17 meters uh, is not active, not available for long range communications at any time during the day. In these mid ranges, uh, during the day, you could potentially get some activity around the world or at least part way around the world. Uh, and then only at night, these would be these would be OK. One way to determine how good the frequencies are for long range communications is to use the WWV radio transmitter. This is an incredibly large radio transmitter that's located in Fort Collins, Colorado. It's run by the government and it transmits signals at various frequencies. If you listen to listen for this radio station at these frequencies, you can get some indication of how good uh, the band conditions are between Fort Collins and yourself, and from that infer how good they are going longer distances around the world. There's a second radio station that's very similar to this, or it's identical to this, in Honolulu, Hawaii. Nowadays, there's a you can also just go to the internet and look up what the band conditions are at your particular time of day. Okay, the next subject are block diagrams and schematics. A block diagram is breaking a system down into individual functions. So let's take a look at what a radio station would look like. We have a transceiver. This is a transmitter and receiver together. So that's one block. We have a microphone. Let's put another block on our diagram for the microphone. And some people use amplifiers because the signal coming out of a transceiver may not be strong enough. They use an amplifier to increase its power. So another block for an amplifier. Okay, and an antenna. These are not just a piece of wire. These are something typically a little bit more complex. So we put a block there for the antenna. Now we also have feed line. A feed line is a wire that goes between the transmitter and the antenna. And it's a very special wire. It's not just the wire you use for wiring up a, a typical appliance in your home. But since it's a special uh, item, we'll make another block for that. So here we have a block diagram that has broken the system down into individual functions. So here is a schematic diagram. A schematic diagram breaks down the system into individual components that are connected together. For example, here is a, a transistor that is connected to a capacitor and it's also connected to a resistor by a wire in between them. And then another wire is connecting those to another coil. So you see all of the individual components that go together and how they're connected to make the system function. So a block diagram breaks a system down by function. A schematic diagram breaks a system down by individual components. OK, and now it's time for the next quiz. Combining information with radio waves. Combining information with radio waves is a special term called modulation. There's various ways of doing this. There's FM, AM, digital, CW, and single sideband. And this is what we're going to be talking about in the next few charts. How do you get the information onto that electromagnetic wave? The first modulation type that we'll be talking about is called CW. And CW is ham radio jargon for Morse code. I'm sure you're familiar with Morse code. Here's an example of it. The radio wave is just continually turned on and off in a different pattern, either dots and dashes. Here we have dit, 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 da, dit, 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 da, which is, this is a Morse code for the letter V, which is also the first part of Beethoven's fifth century, fifth, cent, fifth, symph, fifth symphony, dit, 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 da. All right, you're all familiar with Morse code. I'm sure you've seen this once or twice in your life. This is the patterns that are used for sending CW. Let's see if you can get this one. Da dit dit dit, 
Did 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 da. BS. Digital communications is computer to computer communications. You can kind of think of it as a computer generating CW and then sending that to a transmitter and then the receiver receiving that in, that information and sending it to a computer and the computer converts the CW back into uh, letters and numbers. And there are programs that will do that. But digital communications is much more complex. It has better methods for sending the data. Um, it can use multiple tones, you know, like 16 tones, and each combination of tones could mean something. Uh, it can use different patterns of bits. It's not limited to just off and on. It, it can use um, many different things to communicate the information and can do it much faster than CW and much more accurately than CW. So basically, we have a computer that takes uh, typing, converts it into special sounds. The sounds are sent to the transmitter. They're sent across to a receiver. The receiver sends those sounds into a computer, into the sound card, and a lot of mathematics occurs that decodes that, that sounds into letters and numbers that appear on your screen. All right, AM, amplitude modulation. Remember we talked about amplitude was how far the water goes up and down on your leg? Well, we can change the strength of the electromagnetic wave according to the wave pattern in your voice, and that's amplitude modulation. Now, along with this is single sideband modulation, and this is a little bit hard to explain unless you know a lot more math than you do. So we're just going to say that it's a lot more efficient than AM. AM used to be used by all amateur radio uh, back in the 50s and 60s, but then single sideband came on because it was so, all the power went into the voice. It was much more efficient than uh, using AM. So single sideband is a more efficient way of using an amplitude modulation. Okay. Okay, the next type of modulation that we'll be talking about is frequency modulation. So let's say we have a carrier frequency of 100 megahertz, which is right in the, the FM radio broadcast band. If we apply to that a sound of, let's say, 60 hertz, mm, it's about 60 hertz, that carrier frequency will change to the left slightly and to the right slightly at 60 hertz. Okay, so that's how we get the sound uh, onto the carrier wave. Now, one thing that took me a while to get my head around is the amount of change determines the loudness of the signal. The signal will, will change frequency at 60 hertz, but the magnitude of the frequency change from 100 hertz, 100 megahertz, is the loudness of the signal. All right. So then we have go on to a new subject, and this is NOAA weather radio and emergency radio. These are uh, around the United States. There's standard stations that will transmit safety information, uh, safety radio, safety uh, weather information, and you can use it if you're backpacking or if you're using it on a boat. Here's a safety radios that. Some people keep in their home, uh, battery powered, so that in case of an emergency, the power goes out, they can still use these. Okay, the next subject is how cell phones work. Now you see these around the city, all over the place. These are cell phone towers. And when you talk into your cell phone, you're either sending or receiving information from one of these towers. Cell towers are located everywhere. And each cell tower is responsible for communications within a particular area around the cell tower. When you communicate, you communicate directly with one of these cell towers. If you move from one cell to another, the cell towers communicate and hand off your signal to the next cell tower. When you dial somebody, 
uh, your signal goes along landlines to a switching station that determines where the recipient of your phone call is and then routes your information down to the proper cell tower. And that's how cell systems work. Now it's time for the next quiz. The next area that we'll be talking about is radio safety. And what I'll be talking about are the areas that are specific to ham radio, not the common uh, things that you need to know about grounding plugs and whether or not to use them. But these areas are important to ham radio. And first of all, antennas and power lines do not mix. If you ever put up an antenna, you need to make sure that it's far away from power, power lines. In case the antenna goes down, you do not want high voltage on your antenna going down into your, your radio and perhaps onto your fingers. Uh, there is some uh, stories around that a, an actual scout lost his life by putting up an antenna that hit a power line. Okay, next, antennas attract lightning. So anytime you put up an antenna, you have to make sure that it's properly grounded. There's lightning arresters that you can put into the feed line and also grounding protection that you need to uh, be aware of. There's also special things you need to know about the grounding of your house and the grounding of your antenna. Both of those should be connected outside of your house. You want to keep lightning outside of your house. So in my case, whenever I'm not using my ham radio, I disconnect my antenna. Let's move on to batteries. Now batteries can provide a very large current, but it's a very low voltage. So I've never heard any warnings about people getting electrocuted by low voltage batteries. However, they can provide a large amount of current and they can make a wire glow red very easily. Uh, this little blue battery there, uh, I found out the hard way and immediately changed my circuit and, and put a fuse in it. And you want to have a fuse in your circuit so that if there is a short, it, uh, the fuse will blow before any wires get hot enough to cause a fire or burn you. All right, there's one more area that we need to talk about. The last area is exposure limits. Inside a microwave oven, there are microwaves, which are radio waves that heat up the food. We have to be careful about our ham radios in the same way. It's radio waves, and if they're powerful enough, they can cause damage to your body. Now, this is typically not a problem because normally uh, your power level of your transmitter is relatively low and the antenna is far away from you. But we have to make sure that we are under the exposure limits so that a key part of one of the first exams that you'll be taking if you get a ham radio license is how to calculate uh, the exposure from a particular antenna. Uh, typically, ham, radio ham radios run at about 100 watts. And as long as you're about 20 or 30 feet away from the antenna, you should be OK. Um, the higher frequency bands, you have to be a little bit more careful but again, if you're at relatively low powers and 20 or 30 feet away from the antenna, you're in, you're in good shape. Walkie-talkies only typically transmit at about 5 watts or less, so they're typically not an issue with regard to the exposure limits. Okay, I, I need to say a few words about three-prong plugs. And some, some devices have three-prong plugs and some do not. Basically, what happens is if there is some potential that a hot wire uh, could come loose inside of a in device and become in contact with the outside of the uh, device, then there's a three, third prong of the, uh, on the plug. That third prong connects the outside of the device to ground so that instead of electricity going through your body to ground, if a, a wire gets disconnected and goes to the case, it goes to ground directly and not through your body. So it's important to not cut off the uh, third prong. The, the device will certainly still work if you cut off the prong, but it will not be nearly as safe as it would be. If a device doesn't have a third prong, then it's uh, sufficiently insulated that the user would not be able to get in contact with the a hot wire that got disconnected within the device. Now, if you need to use an adapter 
to connect to a uh, receptacle. Uh, this particular receptacle does have a third prong, but if it did not, you can use an adapter, but that that little tang uh, that is on the adapter uh, should go uh, be screwed on to the center of the receptacle. That screw in the center of the receptacle is a ground that can be used. So if you do use an adapter, you have to use that screw. Okay, now we're ready for quiz number six. Here it is. Okay, there's some great technical career opportunities in radio. There's a design engineer, and these people are the high-level designers. They create the schematics and the block diagrams for a particular system. The uh, design technician then takes the component diagrams and actually lays them out physically on a printed circuit board and identifies where each of the components should be placed. A radio station engineer actually monitors the performance of a radio station and repairs the uh, radio station equipment when necessary. And finally, electronics technicians repair radio equipment. And there's many of these in the military. There's also careers in radio broadcasting. Of course, there's the the personality that's actually on the microphone speaking and, and talking to people. But in addition to that, there's also station directors, station managers, and also program directors. These are the people that are behind the scenes, behind the personalities, making sure that everything works. Then there's also program writers that actually write scripts and write the copy for news and other things. If you enjoy talking on the radio, there are jobs in radio operating. For example, in many cases, operating a radio is part of another job. For example, a policeman or a fireman use a radio a lot during their, their day. In some cases, communicating is the entire job. For example, the 911 operator uses radio and other types of communications in order to get the right resources to the right locations at the right time. An air traffic controller uses radio continuously during the day to coordinate the movement of airplanes in the air and airplanes on the ground. In the military, they have people that are designated as radio operators to keep communications flowing perfectly and getting out orders and, and other information back and forth from people in various places across on the field. So what kind of education is required for these types of careers? Well, for all of them, a high school degree is going to be required. Now, in addition to that, a two-year degree is beneficial if you want to do repairs on electronic equipment or install electronic equipment. For example, install cell phone towers or install switching gear in a cellular telephone system, install radios for a, 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 a police station. A two-year degree should be adequate for those types of jobs. So they can do rather, rather very technical, technical troubleshooting jobs on some complex equipment. If you want to design equipment and design systems, then you'll need a four-year college degree in electrical engineering or electrical engineering technology. This will allow you to design radios, uh, put together blocks of, uh, of uh, systems, um, identify components that need to be put together to create the system that you need. Now, in addition to that, if you want to go into the communications area, uh, you can do a couple of things. You can try to get in by starting out with your own podcasts and trying to get a, a following that way and, and work your way into uh, a, a job. You know, it depends on your personality and the personality that you present on the, on the air. If you want to do some of the back-end systems or even if you want to be a personality, uh, a four-year college degree in communications uh, is probably recommended. So that's it, and we're ready for our next quiz. So why does the government allow people to become radio amateurs? Well, there's various reasons. First of all, we provide some public service. 
Now, in the distant past, when communications was very expensive and wasn't very extensive with regard to going around the world, ham radio provided a way to, to relay messages. But that's gone by the wayside. Currently, we do provide emergency communications in case the standard public communication systems go down, and also provide additional communications for special events like marathons or, or bicycle races. An additional point is that through our connections around the world, we provide a certain amount of international goodwill by the friendships that we create in communicating with other amateurs. Third, a certain amount of experimentation occurs when some developments, some significant developments, have come out of ham radio. In addition, people that have been trained in ham radio when they are young go on into different technical areas and develop some very significant advancements. So it's kind of a springboard and also a, a way of uh, developing new talent. Last, uh, when you talk on the radio, you, de you develop communication skills. You become more proficient at explaining yourself and, and explaining logical reasons for, for doing things. So that is a, a key development activity that uh, can occur throughout the population of ham radios, ham radio operators. And last, like what we're doing now, a, a significant amount of STEM education can come from ham radio as well. Anybody that gets their ham radio license has to be become familiar with certain technical aspects about radios and, uh, and uh, the science of radios. In the beginning of this lecture series, we talked about what you can do with a ham radio. And we'll, let's do a quick review. We can do digital communications and voice communications all over the world. We can communicate through satellites and also have fun doing fox hunting and racing to a, a distant uh, hidden transmitter. We also build uh, special devices, make it out of components and from circuits we find or circuits we design. We put radio transmitters on balloons, send them up and watch them go around the world perhaps. And again, emergency communications uh, that uh, my club is very much into. Bouncing signals off the moon, which is something I want to do uh, in the next few years. And also Skywarn, where we uh, people with their ham radios uh, relay information back up to authorities. Last, we go through and do uh, slow scan television perhaps from uh, the International Space Station, climb mountains and do summits on the air, uh, see how far we can transmit uh, from up on top of a, tra uh, uh, a, a mountain. We do mobile communications, usually in a car, sometimes by bicycle. We set up our ham radios in, in parks to give people the thrill of trying to use a ham radio uh, in a park. Last, we help out with Jamboree on the Air and provide a way for uh, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts to communicate to other, other Scouts around the world uh, once a year. Next, let's look at the types of ham radio equipment there is. There's a base station transceiver. Now, this looks rather complex, but it's relatively easy to use once you identify the, the key functions. This is the, the main part of a radio station, a home radio station. Some ham radio stations become very complex. Mine's very simple with only one, one transceiver and a power supply. But some people uh, are very much into this hobby and uh, they can get very extensive equipment connect connections and installations. Mobile communications. This is an example of a mobile transceiver that mounts on the dashboard or under the dashboard and is used uh, for communications uh, while driving. Some people go crazy with this as well. Uh, this is a little bit distracting while you drive. There's HTs. This is handheld or walkie-talkies. These are good for short-range communication on the upper bands. And typically, uh, the mobile communication and the handhelds go through a repeater. This is where a, a low, low power signal is received by a repeater 
and then transmitted again at a different frequency at a very high at a much higher power that way you can get much more distance out of a, a very small transmitter there's emergency calls what happens if you have a ham radio and you see an emergency well you get on the radio and you use certain nomenclature certain words break break please help me mayday break break mayday or mayday or just simply emergency I need help so a ham radio operator will answer you get information and relay that to uh, the authorities if you only have Morse code you can send SOS dot 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 dash 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 dot 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 if you're lost in the woods and you have a whistle this is what you send okay another thing on your test is popular ham abbreviations and here's a few of them you the test requires five of these so DX we talked about DX a lot it's long-range communication HT handy talky or walkie talky QTH we haven't talked about but it means your location so quiet that home I don't know maybe you can use that to help you remember QTH digital communications computer to commuter CW that's Morse code or continuous wave and to say goodbye ham radio operators use 73 73 don't ask me why they use 73 how can you remember the number 73 7 plus 3 equals 10 okay the next thing that we want to talk about is radio amateur licensing there's actually three levels of licensing each, with each level you get more and more privileges to use either different types of modulation or different bands okay the lowest level the very entry level is called technician and the test for a technician is the, as well as the test for all of the other levels consists of 35 multiple choice questions and the multiple choice questions are taken from a pool of about 150 questions uh, that are uh, readily available so you buy a book that contains the 150 questions you read through it and I and learn the the correct answers to all 150 and then take the test now in that process you will learn a lot about radio uh, you don't have to get a perfect score I believe the it's a 80% uh, passes so it's, it's a it's not that difficult many people get this test in it and are able to pass this test within a, a month or so the next level is okay once you have your technician license you're then able to communicate using a handy talkie or a, a mobile mobile radio in the higher bands and you're able to use repeaters mostly for local communication you're also allowed to use CW communications on the lower bands and you're able to communicate around the world using CW the next level up is called general and again it's the same sort of 35 question test chosen from a pool of questions the studying is the same and once you pass this you're allowed to uh, communicate using all different modes of operation on all bands uh, except for sm small segments of the bands where you're not allowed to operate but you're allowed to use any type of modulation on any band the next level extra class is gives you full permissions on in all bands and it also allows you to become a, a person who can actually give the exams so here's an example of what I was talking about with regard to privileges uh, and licenses so if you have a technician license well before I go into this uh, we talked about wavelength and frequency being closely related usually ham radio operators refer to bands as the wavelength so there's an 80 meter wavelength band a 60 meter wavelength band a 40 meter wavelength band a 30 meter wavelength band 20 etc 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 so on the 80 meter band if you have a technician license 
you can transmit CW on this portion of the band. If you have a general license, you're able to transmit CW and digital in this portion of the band and transmit any kind of voice communication in this area. If you have an extra class license, you're allowed to transmit voice communications in this area and digital and CW in this area. In the next band up uh, 40 meters, uh, you have a similar situation with technician having a rather large area where they can communicate using CW. Again, general and then extra class. And now we're ready for quiz eight. Okay, we're going to have some demonstrations now. And here's some things. When you're on the air, uh, you can think about some of these questions. Uh, what was his purpose of the radio station? What equipment did you see? What was the equipment used for? What type of licenses are required to use and maintain the equipment?